when I'm broadcasting, which is already slow. Okay. Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Gopi Janabalaba Giri Bharadhari Gopi Janabalaba Giri Bharadhari Jishodhanandana Brajajana Ranjana Jishodhanandana Brajajana Ranjana Jumana Tira Banachari Jamuna Tira Banachari Jiradha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jiradha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Sisiradha Madhava Ki Jai Nitai Gaur Pramanandi Hari Hari Bo Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Maum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tinamane Namaste, Sharashati Deve, Gauravani Pacharine, Nirvise, Sasanyavari, Paschachirisatarine. So, what I hope we are accomplishing, one of the things we're accomplishing is in our reading of Srimad Bhagavatam, is seeing its application in today's world, seeing the relationship between what has always gone on in this world and what is going on in this world and how. Therefore, the Bhagavatam becomes relevant. Uh, sometimes we might think it's not relevant. Or we're reading stories that seem irrelevant to our lives. Um, but they're, as I said on Monday, they're blueprints of how things should be. And at least if it can't be that way exactly, it can be closer to that according to what's practical. So that's that's at least at this point in time in the history of the world, that's how we look at it. Maybe the world will change more in the future and these ideas in the Bhagavatam will be more acceptable to people in general and more applicable. And maybe there will be even countries in the world which may be interested in learning more and applying, that's also possible. Anyway, Prabhupada gave a standard and said, this is, this is how it should be, whether or not it, it can be exactly like that now is, is not really what we're talking about in these classes, but we're trying to understand the principles, the ideas, concepts, especially for us, what it means to be a Brahmin, because the Brahmins are very much involved in the story of King Vena. And we've been talking, as far as I remember, a lot about Varnashram in this. And, you know, Varnashram is also something that might appear irrelevant to most of us. I just have to go to work today and make enough money so I can keep the roof over my head and put food on the table. And if I just pack my bags and live under a tree, it probably wouldn't work. Um, it's also possible if you, in the way we're trying to put a roof over our head, it may not work in the future also. So then living under a tree may uh, all of a sudden become more practical. Of course, Varnashram doesn't mean just living in a tree living under a tree. It may le mean living in a city also. <clears throat> but it's a radical, a radically different kind of city and a radically different kind of lifestyle. And sometimes it's only when something which seems good or advanced doesn't work that we realize it doesn't work. 
Uh, sometimes we realize it doesn't work, but we can't give it up. So it has to explode before we give it up. So these are possibilities in the future. We don't know if Mahaprabhu's movement is meant to encompass the world. Uh, there will likely be changes in the world that make that more possible. And we've already seen many changes in the world that makes that possible. So that's the idea. So let's continue. This is verse 22. Yagena yushmat vishaye dvijati bir ditayamanena. Surakala hare svaishta satushta pradishanti vachitam tadelanam narhasi vira cheshtitam. When all the Brahmins engage in performing sacrifices in your kingdom, all the demigods who are plenary expansions of the Lord will be very much satisfied by their activities and will give you your desired result. Therefore, O hero, do not stop the sacrificial performances. If you stop them, you will disrespect the demigods. So what's interesting, what I find interesting about this verse and, and verses which describe demigods and other phenomena which is not visible to our eyes is that when was the last time you saw a demigod? Did you see one yesterday? How about last week? Week before, last month, last year? Yeah, we haven't, well, we've seen deities, but we haven't, seen, we don't have ex direct experience of demigods. And now Shastra is talking about something we have no experience of, which then can be for some difficult to accept. Or just we stop and say, okay, there's this principle that if you honor the demigods because they're in charge of the universe, whatever you need will be supplied by them, which is, of course, a concept which is not known <clears throat> to people outside of India, unless they're Indians or studied Indian philosophy. And something... Um, although practiced perhaps by indigenous cultures around the world, not something that the modern world has adopted. So we look for solutions through technologies like seeding clouds to get rain, uh, call up Monsanto to produce seeds and fertilizer, and mining and other uh, and that's just one example, but, but the point is that in looking for improving the world, uh, just speaking politically, sociologically, uh, improving things in the world, or even psychologically, or looking to solve problems, to, who factors in the demigods? Well, we have to make, you know, well, we have this shortage here. Well, we have to factor in that we're not getting enough rain because we're not worshiping Indra. Um, when was the last time that came up in your Congress, your parliament of your country? It's interesting, isn't it? So we'll make another solution. Well, we'll, in, we'll get another county in our state to build a pipeline and we'll pipe water in or we'll seed clouds or we'll do something. <clears throat> so it's pretty significant when you think about it. So what this verse is saying is that if you worship demigods, then whatever you need, you will get. At least whatever we need from nature will be supplied because the demigods are in charge. And what it's really saying is that the demigods aren't happy with us, then they're going to say, tough luck. You're not, you don't feed us, you don't honor us, we're not taking care of you. Um, and Prabhupada said that wherever you see prosperity, it's because there have been sages living in those areas, and due to their sacrifice and service, then the earth provides what is needed. And as a country becomes impious, uh, then the cycle shifts in the opposite direction. 
So that would be a hard sell to any government head. But anyway, that's what's being explained here. So we, un we understand it, at least we should understand that that's what's going on, right? And of course for us, Prabhupada never told us to worship the demigods. And he said, by doing Sankirtan, by worshiping Krishna, all the demigods will be worshiped, so we don't have to make independent effort. But still, I think the point is that we shouldn't totally rely in our vision of the universe and our decision-making and so forth. We shouldn't totally rely on just what we can see with our eyes. And we shouldn't be so quick to doubt things which we can't see, which is, of course, how we're being influenced today. If you, you know, by definition, science, science is saying, bad definition, but science is saying, and if you can't experiment with it, then it doesn't exist. So, so there has to be, you have to be able to see it or touch it or smell it or taste it or hear it, then you can experiment on it. And if you can't, you can't experiment on it. And if you can't experiment on it, it doesn't exist, which <clears throat> even sounds stupid to a kid, doesn't it? If you can't experiment on something, it doesn't exist, really. And there's things that exist you can't experiment on because experiments have to be controlled. And some things are not controlled, like living entities. So you can't uh, do it. Well, definitely you can't experiment on God because you can't control him. So even if he does exist, you can't experiment on him, right? Because you need to control him. So anyway, it gets quite ridiculous. And I think it's important for us, as I've said, sometimes I like to laugh at how stupid things are. And I don't, I don't mean it in a derogatory way, but it's always been an historical fact that the intellectual, the intellectuals, the philosophers, the thinkers, the writers, they're always laughing at what's going on because, because what's going on is laughable. It's sad also. But it's laughable in the degree of its foolishness, isn't it? And so it's not bad for us to laugh at it. And we're not laughing at it thinking, oh, these, um, we are so smart, we're so much better. We're laughing at it because we're seeing, we're seeing things as they are. And that is what's keeping our faith strong in Christian consciousness. If you don't see it as they are, you will see it as you see it or as other people see it, but that could undermine your faith in Krishna consciousness because naturally uh, transcendentalists see things differently. They have vision by which they can see things differently. So that's the idea. So I think you all understand that, but I just wanted to reinforce that. So now we'll go to text 23. So now Vena is gonna speak and say something absolutely, I predict, ridiculous. <clears throat> Based on his narcissistic, uh, he seems to be like um, the, the Adi narcissist, doesn't like, you know, for his purposes, he'll do whatever. Doesn't really care about other people. Can't and narciss One aspect of a narcissist is they don't feel others' pain. Uh, if you're a devotee, not good to be a nar narcissistic because qualification of a devotee, according to Krishna and the Gita, is that you feel pain and therefore you feel the pain of others because you know that you feel pain. So when you see somebody suffering, as a devotee thinks, any compassion person thinks, if I was in that situation, I would suffer. And uh, sometimes we've explained, a Bhaktivinoda Thakur said that Compassion means I cannot tolerate suffering. Compassion in regards to humility means that nobody should suffer on my account. So maybe you've done something wrong. No, I don't want you to suffer just because of me. I'm not that important. So devotee is very feeling. 
in this area. And it's just the quality of a pure devotee that they feel this way. They don't, they don't like to see other people suffer. In fact, they're willing to suffer themselves so other people won't suffer, which is an amazing quality, of course. So, Vena Uvacha, Balisha Bata Yuyam Ba Adharme Dharma Mahani Naha. Ye Bhritti Dham Patim Hitpa Jaram Patim Upasate. King Vena replied, oh, I predicted he would say something stupid, and he, his first sentence is as stupid as it gets. You are not at all experienced, a classic, narcissistic, proud person. You know, the Brahmins, the most intelligent class, speak to you and you tell them you're stupid. It is very much regrettable that you are maintaining something which is not religious and are accepting it as religious. Indeed, I think you're giving up your real husband who maintains you and are searching after some paramour to worship. In other words, they're um, criticizing him and he's saying, you're giving up your real husband. I'm the one who is maintaining you and you're criticizing me. As we say, don't cut off the hand that feeds you. So he's accusing them of that. Purport, King Vena was so foolish that he accused the saintly sages of being inexperienced like small children. In other words, he was accusing them of not having perfect knowledge. In this way, he could reject their advice and make accusations against them, comparing them to a woman who does not care for her husband, who maintains her, but goes to satisfy a paramour who does not maintain her. The purpose of this simile is apparent. It is the duty of the chatras to engage the Brahmins in different types of religious activities. And the king is supposed to be the maintainer of the Brahmanas. If the Brahmanas do not worship the king, but instead go to the demigods, they are as polluted as unchaste women. So here you have a classic, the first line is a classic example of someone who cannot defeat an argument. The, the, the sign of someone who cannot defeat an argument is they attack the person who just said what they can't defeat. So you see here what, what is our friend Mars Vena doing? He's not addressing what they're saying. He's addressing what he perceives as the faults of the brahmanas and sages and is attacking them. So there's no question of debating. There's no question of debating the question, he has avoided it. Have you ever heard uh, someone say when asked a question, that's a stupid question? Or only an idiot would ask a question like that. That, that didn't answer the question, obviously, right? So, when one has no good argument, generally they will attack the person who asked the question. And that's known as ad hominem. You, I make an argument, you know, I well, won't use me as an example, that might upset you. We'll, we'll take a fictitious person, makes an argument, and instead of addressing the argument, said, that guy's such an idiot. Didn't say anything about what he said. Uh, maybe that idiot said something intelligent, and maybe you're not intelligent enough to answer that or rebuke it. So that's what he's doing here. This is classic. Uh, politicians do this a lot. That's a stupid question. You're stupid. I don't have to answer your question. Why would I want to answer your question? You just, you just publish fake news. Things like that. Um, in other words, anyone who uh, understands this will think, oh, he doesn't have an answer to that question, or he's wrong, he's been proven wrong, he cannot prove himself right. And so it plays into people who don't understand what's going on. But the people who understand what's going on are very frustrated. The people who don't understand 
think the person who's speaking is very witty, charismatic, clever, sharp, and so forth. But actually, he just doesn't have an answer. So our friend Vena, that's what he's doing. Oh, what a, you guys are stupid. What a, you just like, you know, I'm maintaining you and you're criticizing, and you're criticizing me. Vena, just listen to what we're saying. Forget the, forget the etiquette here. Just listen to what we're saying. This is for your benefit. No, he can't listen. So as you know, I've said many times that I like reading stories about these, these very, very demoniac people. Usually they end up, as, as is common, they end up in very high positions. I don't know, Murphy's Law is working there or what? Why do, they, why do the worst people end up in the highest position sometimes? That's very interesting. And the best people, you know, they have no voice. Anyway, so have you ever been given good advice and just wanted to attack the person who gave it? I would assume the answer would be yes, at least if you've lived more than a couple of years. Or maybe it only takes maybe a few months, actually, before that happens. I guess we do it more when we're young. But um, let us learn from this. It is, everyone who's older knows it's extremely, I mean, it's difficult enough to take feedback, but everyone who's a little older knows how difficult it is to take feedback from people the age of your children or grandchildren. It's like very, very difficult. But what if the feedback is correct? So now, what I've been studying recently is um, various aspects of humility. And I think we have a very, very confined definition of humility, at least when we are speaking about practical application. Because here gives us, gives us um, another way to look at humility when you're given some feedback, whether it, you feel it's valid or not, but given with some by someone who's generally trying to help you, how do you react to it? If you react by attacking, that's another, you know, this is what he's doing. He's attacking. Have you ever done that? Someone tells you, you know, you don't clean up after you eat. And your first response is, well, you don't always clean up either. Which didn't really help get anything clean. But that's the natural conditioned response, which comes from pride. So we have to have some antennas on our head to try to understand better not only what humility is, but the opportunities for it and the missed opportunities. That was a missed opportunity for humility. It was also a missed opportunity to have a cleaner kitchen. So you lost on two accounts. Your kitchen's still dirty and you're prouder than you were before you got the feedback. You, um, you raised the meter on your pride, you know, went up when you fought. We don't normally think that way. We just think, who are you to tell me? You're my daughter-in-law. Like, you have no right to say that. Yeah, but what if what she said was true? Do you have a right just because you're the father or father-in-law or the boss? Do you have a right to avoid the truth? Well, maybe in some cultures you, you have a right, but for us as devotees, even if we have a right culturally, it still, it still stems from a lack of humility to be able to hear it. Correct? You agree? Any, all of you who are young, when you're older, you'll get to experience this. How, how much more difficult it is to hear good advice from someone who feels is not it's not proper for them to give it. I was just listening before class started to a story you've probably heard before. It's about Srila Prabhupada asking Shama Sundar to ask George Harrison if he would donate $19,000, equivalent today, or that time, or the equivalent today, 100,000, 150. That was 1969 when the minimum wage 
It was about a dollar an hour in America. And now it's 10 to 15 an hour. So we'll do the minimum 10 times. Okay, so that's 190,000. And this is pound, those are pounds. So it's about $200,000 donation. You know, not a lot for a beetle, but still in principle, it's still a lot of money. And it was interesting because Shama Shundar, Shama Shundar, Shundar, not Shundar, Shama Shundar, it's not Shundar, it's Shund Shundar, Shama Shundar, was saying, Prop, I, I don't think we should do it because I just don't feel it's right for our relationship to ask him. And Prabhupada's saying, no, you should do it. It'll work out. And Shama Sundar was saying, well, we've ne you know, we never asked. Our strategy is just when he wants to give, he'll give, and it keeps the relationship better. So he was apparently arguing with Prabhupada, not really arguing, but he was just expressing how he felt and what he thought was best for preaching. But as I was listening to it, I was thinking, okay, he's disagreeing with Prabhupada. Not that he wouldn't do it if Prabhupada insisted. That wasn't what was going on. That's not their relationship. But he was discussing it. And Prabhupada didn't say, I'm your guru, just listen to me, do what I say. You don't know what you're talking about. He never said that. He said, no, I think it, you just, just ask him, it'll work out, he'll be okay. Like Prabhupada knew, Prabhupada could see the future often. He often he just knew what was going on. Um, I, and so, but the point is, there was some discussion, but Prabhupada wasn't thinking, who are you, my disciple, to tell me that I'm making the instruction I'm giving you is wrong, it's bad. He didn't think like that. So, even Srila Prabhupada, uh, sometimes when given feedback, or maybe not sometimes, maybe all the time, would not take this position of who are you? Although he had a right to do that as guru because it could be a breach of etiquette. And certainly if, if it is a breach of etiquette, he would tell them not because of his own ego, but because it is. You may know this story. It's so interesting. There was a, an initiation, I think it was a Buri place, and so many things were going wrong and Prabhupada was very upset. And Prabhupada, as you would see, especially get upset when there were offenses being made to the deities. So when he was upset, it wasn't because he was upset, it was because of offenses being made to the deity and he was very angry. And then some new bhakta just come to the temple a few days ago, really didn't understand Prabhupada, but just was repeating what he was told. And he said, um, Prabhupada, don't be angry, just chant Hare Krishna, it'll be okay, something like that. And so Prabhupada just stopped and started chanting. Like, he, like, who are you, you know, you know what it's like when you're angry and some little bhakta tells you, you know, just chant Hare Krishna, stop being angry. Even you, being a devotee for a year or two, would probably, you know, it's like, get out of here. Don't talk to me, you know, go, go downstairs. I don't want to see you. And Prabhupada just did it. So now I know some of you are thinking something, and I, this is really difficult. And we have to talk about it. Because when I talk about these things, I know that many of you, maybe all of you, are thinking in your mind that what you're saying is true. I like it. We should, we should have antennas for humility. We should be able to see uh, all these opportunities we have for being humble. And we should be able to see how uh, often we become proud when we shouldn't, just like Vena. That's why we're talking about this, because Vena is our example here. What he's doing is what we should not do. And, and we always think, oh, that's Vena, he does that. You know, like, like I'm perfect, and I never like that. But don't think that way. That's why we're discussing Vena, to see how we're like that. So here's the problem, and it is definitely a problem. We have to address it. 
when we hear these things, what often comes to mind, and you don't have to say whether this came to mind or not, but I know it does. You start thinking about a leader who acts a little bit like Vena, a leader in the Hare Krishna movement, you're like, and you're thinking, well, actually, what you said is true because, you know, there's a leader in my area, and anytime we've tried to give him feedback, he just tells us, who are you? You're just a Bhaktin. You're just Bhaktin Bozetto or Bhakta Bozo. So, you know, who are you to tell me? I'm, you, know, you know how long I've been a devotee? You know how many books I've distributed? How many temples I've opened? You know, like that. So, that is a problem when we see that. And not only is it a problem, sometimes it's scary because you think, well, this devotee that just told me that he's been a devotee like 35 years, am I gonna be like that when I'm in 35 years? Am I gonna still be like, someone's gonna try to give me some feedback and I'm gonna say, Bhakta Bozo, if I see your face again, if you, Bhakta Bozo, if you ever say that again, I will show you the door onto the street. And things like this. I'm, I'm, I hopefully things like this aren't happening in this gone. We're not happening often, but they definitely have happened for sure. This is such a difficult thing. When we learn proper behavior, we become more keenly aware of improper behavior. In fact, we start seeing improper behavior where we didn't see it. I don't know if you have that experience, but we have this experience with Japa. When or anything that you try to improve yourself doing, I was just like, you know, I was just listening. I don't know, I heard some old song, Beatles song, and I'm listening and going, oh, he missed that note a little bit. You know, I never noticed that as. But, you know, it's like, like, I have to do some recording, so I have to be a little more conscious. I'm like, oh, he was a little flat on that note. Of course, they didn't have auto-tune and whatever, you know. Um, they didn't care, whatever. Um, also, you know, it, sometimes, you know, it's more natural. It's more real. You know, auto-tune is like, nobody's perfect. It's better to be imperfect. But um, we notice things when we're trying to perfect them. And or when we learn the standard, we notice them. Hare Krishna. So this is difficult. That's very difficult. And we see some frailty in a respected leader. Well, as you probably know, perfection does not exist in this world. So we will see imperfection. And we all have different kinds of imperfection. But two things can happen, two unfortunate things can happen, maybe more than two, when we see these things. Number one, we become offensive. And so we minimize the good qualities of that devotee. And we focus on what he just did that we don't approve of. As I said, number two, we can lose faith. If he, if he can't do it, how can I do it? And number three, well, the way Prabhupada told us to think is, well, three and four, see that the devotee is sincere, he's just conditioned. And take note that this developing this quality is going to be difficult. Even he's not doing it well. So I really, I'm really going to have to work on this. That's how you want to take everything back to yourself. Isn't it? That's the difficulty, because it's, it's much easier to take it to them and say they have the fault. Okay, I, I can't, I'm not fault finding, I just see it. It's a reality. It's not an opinion. It's just, this is what happened. But the way we're supposed to take it is, okay, it happened, it exists. That means this is not going to be easy. That even this devotee, who I have so much respect for, has a weakness or has a blind spot or is conditioned in a particular way. But I've become aware of it. Maybe this devotee is not aware of it. I've become aware of it. So I, therefore, I have an opportunity, right? To try to deal with it. Does that make sense? Because this is, this is gonna be something that you're gonna to have to deal with your whole life. 
you're going to, you know, because this world is not perfect. And because we're conditioned souls, you're going to see imperfection in those you would expect to be perfect. And it's going to, it can affect your faith in Krishna consciousness and or if it doesn't affect your faith in Krishna consciousness, it can affect your faith in yourself. How can I do that if they can't? And I, I don't think we should believe ever that we can't become pure. But what we can take from this is that it will take work. If even this person has difficulty, it just shows the depth of conditioning that we're dealing with. So in any case, back to the original point is that Vena could not accept good advice. And Chanakya Pandit has said, if you try to give good advice to a fool, they become angry, which is definitely a fact. And if you ever get good advice and you become angry, you have the, thus certified yourself as a fool, just so you know. You can mark that down in your diary. Today, I was a fool. I got good advice and I became angry. According to Chanakya Pandit, I'm a fool. Now, what actually is happening is that, let's go a little deeper. Is it difficult to admit a mistake? For, for your average person? Generally, yes, but it also depends on the, your association, the people that you're with. Because if you live in a culture where everyone's pretending to be perfect, it's very, very difficult to admit you're imperfect. If you live in a culture where no one's pretending to be perfect, it's very easy because nobody cares. Actually, we would only care if you pretend to be perfect. We would not care if you admit you have faults. We would be worried if you didn't, right? That's a healthy culture, right? Where we can all be vulnerable. Do you know that in any religious organization, which is trying to create pure devotees, and which does not allow uh, a culture where we can be vulnerable, then everyone will live in shame. And shame is pretty much down there on the emotional scale, you know, just a few, I guess a few notches above depression, uh, or maybe the next notch, because shame is usually coming from uh, feeling imperfect and feeling unlovable and so forth which usually precedes depression, as far as I understand, which then precedes suicidal tendencies. So we, we should strive individually and communally to be vulnerable, to create a culture in which being honest is valued. Now, this is really strange to say, and it's, it's, it's strange to say that in many places in ISKCON, we have a culture in which pretension is valued. I have to show up pretending to be more pure than I am. And why is this strange? Because it's totally against our philosophy. Prabhupada calls that duplicity, duplicitousness, lack of integrity, pretension. This is all against humility, right? Because humility is not about pretension. Humility is, is about acknowledging who we are. This is who I am. It's just like I'm not pretending to be somebody else. And what's also interesting, not only is it, it, it ingrained in our philosophy, it's ingrained in the prayers of the acharyas. They're very, they're very vulnerable about their fallen condition. And also Srila Prabhupada was. Prabhupada would sometimes talk about his grihasta life and his challenges and his faults openly, publicly. Have you noticed that? If you listen to Prabhupada enough, you will start to see that he'll, he'll just talk about something um, very easily. When I was a Grihasta, I had this, and 
that and you know sp specifically the story of him having to take sannyas and he was afraid and you know like you know that's being vulnerable you know my guru Maharaj came to me in a dream he said take sannyas and i was terrified and in a culture in which we all seek uh, we all think that everyone has to be perfect that if you're krishna conscious you can't have a fault then the leader cannot be vulnerable because when he's vulnerable, people lose faith in him. And so I, I wrote a Vyas Puja offering, and one, and I was being extremely vulnerable. It was for my own purification. I mean, I was maybe amplifying my fallen nature more, because that's kind of what you do when you write Vyas Puja offerings. And one uh, devotee read it and criticized me, said, how can you be a guru? Look at, you have all these attachments and, you know, and this and that. Um, so basically what I was doing was admitting that sometimes I think this way. It wasn't my normal way of thinking. It was just sometimes these thoughts come, from which this person thought, well, so that's just how he is. So you can't, as a leader, be vulnerable, be be in a society which doesn't value it because people will minimize you. And that's very unhealthy if, if we can't be vulnerable because then we can't purify ourselves through the vulnerability and we can't set the example for the others. Then we set the example of pretension. I'll just pretend to be perfect all the time. I can't make a mistake. So now I can't make a mistake. So there's no way you can ever approach me and say, you know, I think we should do it a different way. You can't because I can't make a mistake. And so um, then we can't have any discussion. Or, oh, you know, you asked me to do this, but I don't think I'm able to do it. You doubt me. You doubt my instruction to hell with you. You know, so um, it's a very unhealthy environment to create. And it's, it's it's what's what's happening is is our human condition is playing into it. And I was thinking about this. It's, it's kind of interesting as a general principle. Our human condition plays into this phenomena of of trying to just show ourselves as better than we are, because the ego, you know, wants to be appreciated and we want to be accepted in the society. And to be accepted, we think, well, we have to be pure. And what's so interesting about it is. That has nothing to do with Krishna consciousness. It's not about that at all. It's about human conditioning is about that. False ego is about that. But that can easily become the culture because you get a lot of people with false ego together who all feel they have to show that they're pure to be accepted by one another. And then the philosophy just kind of gets buried. Isn't that interesting? And it's not only interesting, it's it's pretty serious as a problem. So whatever you can do in your area of influence and jurisdiction to prevent this from happening, do it. And in, in one sense, it's not that difficult to prevent because our philosophy supports it. it of course, it's difficult to go against the culture or, or, you know, when conditioning comes in and people start believing the philosophy teaches something it doesn't, then what can you do? You know, then it's like, it's human nature takes over and then we validate it with philosophy. I'm going to chastise you. I find a shloka that says I can chastise you, but actually it's just my conditioning coming up because I, I couldn't accept the feedback you gave me. <laughs> so I look for a shloka so I can, if I can slam you with that shloka, then I win and I prove you wrong. So we don't want to create that kind of culture. So I think it's important for us uh, to understand humility in a variety of ways, a broad spectrum, so to speak, because I think we tend to have this like strange understanding of humility, or maybe we or only one aspect of it, which we can't even relate to. And because we can't relate to it, we, we have a hard time just understanding what it is. But to be able to acknowledge, oh, somebody told me, gave me some feedback, and I just told them, who are you? Do you know how many books I've distributed? And who are you to tell me? That's just the false ego flared up. It's pride. And pride is really the enemy of bhakti. 
because pride is it's the opposite of love. So if you want to love Krishna, you can't have pride. It doesn't work. So we want to see it in ourselves. If we see it in others, if there's any way we can help them, if we see it in the culture of our temples or sanghas, if there's anything we can do to remove it, do it. One of the ways we can remove it, if it's safe to do this, it may not always be safe. One of the ways we can do it is by modeling it. And I'll give you an example. When I teach uh, my forgiveness course, I'm, I explain the issue that I was dealing with that I was able to let go of, which led me to creating the course. And it's not uncommon for people to say, you know, it was, you made it easy for me to be vulnerable because you were vulnerable. So as, as leaders, or even if you're not a leader, because, you know, we all make up the culture, the more of us that are willing to admit our mistakes, or the, the more of us who are not pretending to be something we are not, the better, because when I'm vulnerable, it makes it easy for you to be vulnerable. When I'm not vulnerable, it makes it difficult for you to be vulnerable because then you'll feel you're going to be judged, right? So again, I find this topic so interesting because, you know, we might say, well, where is the word vulnerability in Shastra? It's a synonym. It's an aspect of humility. Maybe, maybe in, I, I see it as a synonym, but let's just say for those who may not agree exactly, to be safe, we can say it's an aspect of humility to be able to admit mistakes as the acharyas do in their prayers. And that's exactly what Vena cannot do. And I predicted he would say something stupid because that's what stupid people do. When they open their mouth, they say stupid things. That's what proud people do. We had a joke about one politician in America. I said, well, how can you tell if he's lying? He said, oh, that's easy. His mouth is moving. That's how you know. His lips are moving. That's how you know he's lying. Yeah. Hare Krishna. So we can know. How do you know Van is going to say something stupid? Because his lips are moving. It must be. right. So he's a really good example for us. Okay, so um, I'm tempted to go to the chat because that way we don't get too far off from the topic we were discussing. So I'm going to go back and see. Um, you know, when I wait till ten, till like an hour of the talk, then we sometimes forget what we were talking about. Corporate says, the indigenous people of Latin America have the belief that the rains, the water, and the food and lands are manifest due to sacrament. Yeah. So they do some rituals called pajamentos, payment, where they sing to the water. Yeah, that's, that's why we worship demigods. The rains, the food, the lands are due to the sacrament. So they do rituals. Whoops. Where they... Sing to the water, the rains, and they give seeds to the land as an offering. These practices are becoming more and more common in my country. You know, well, that's exactly the whole concept of worshiping the demigods. You know, you, uh, I don't know if you know this, Gorbriya, but Prabhupada talked about the, the, the demigods like energy departments in the government and said, you're using the sun every day. You don't think you have to pay for it. You're using the water. You don't think you have to pay for it. And so the idea is you have to worship the sun god. You have to worship the rain god and so forth because they're supplying just as you pay your electricity bill and your water bill. Isn't that interesting? So, you know, so Prabhupada would say, you're not paying, so look at now, you may not get rain. Kopinath is saying something profound. The absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. <laughs> okay, I'll think about that for the next three days, try to understand. Uh, In other words, the absence of evidence doesn't mean something doesn't exist. This one, I don't know if I told you this, but this one man speaking to an atheist, he said, of all the knowledge that exists, 
how much knowledge do you have? And the man said, maybe 3%, which I thought it's kind of an overestimate, don't you think? But any case, it's a small amount of the total knowledge. And then the person said, so 97% of all the knowledge that exists, you don't have. The man said, yes. He said, uh, so the person who asked the original question said, is it possible that God's within that 97% of what you don't know? Like, how could you say, no, it's not possible? Now you could say, well, there is no God. Well, the idea there is no God, is that possible to be within the 97% of things you don't know that you got either don't know or you got wrong? Anyway, so Kamala's giving us a, a little comment on, we were talking about suffering, feeling suffering. Srila Advaita Acharya felt so much pain for people suffering in material existence that he prayed to the Lord for his appearance as mercy avatar. Yeah, a pure devotee cannot actually tolerate the pain of others. Question from P. You said, they are ready to suffer themselves to not see other people suffer. I can see that this is admirable. Mm. But my question is, where goes the fine line between being a pure devotee, acting out of compassion, and just being codependent? Can it not be a risk that taking someone's pain hinders them from growing through having to deal with their karma? No doubt that we need to feel and show compassion, but don't we also need to look after ourselves? Well, let's, let's use some examples of what's actually going on in the minds of a devotee. In the mind of a devotee, he's looking at someone's suffering. And he's thinking, Krishna actually wants all these people to go back to Godhead. That's his desire. But Krishna kind of leaves it up to devotees to do that work. So now the burden is on me. So if Krishna wants everyone to go back to Godhead, maybe I could just take all their karma on my shoulder, and then Krishna would agree, because there's no karma to send them back to God. It's totally out of compassion. It's just like, get on the spaceship and go back and get out of this world. So the considerations that you're talking about are overridden by the depth of emotion. And the considerations you're talking about are correct if you're approaching it in a more intellectual way. Like, okay, well, this is, you know, plan. This is the three-step plan to get you out of the material world, which is the way it naturally works. But the compassion of a devotee, we're talking here, this is an emotional response to the problem, not an intellectual one. And so it just shines light on the difference, right? You know, could you imagine, <laughs> you know, somebody's in pain and they're suffering, and you could help them. You're thinking, you know, actually, they'll probably learn a lot by suffering. I, I just think, you know, I mean, it's right there in the Bhagavatam. You know, that maybe they'll realize what they've done and maybe they'll take it as Krishna's mercy. I'm not going to do anything. So that's true. I'm not saying it's not. But the soft-hearted devotee is not going to think like that. Soft-hearted devotee doesn't philosophize his compassion away. His compassion just dominates it over, you know, it over it overturns everything. I mean, Prabhupada coming here almost defies logic, doesn't make sense. And him staying here def is, to a certain degree defies logic. But his desire to help conditioned souls, his compassion overrides it all. So uh, in some cases, I wouldn't say in every case, but in some cases, compassion is the overriding factor. And so you wouldn't want to limit your compassion through philosophy. Of course, if you know we're not on these levels that we're willing to suffer everyone's karma, so it's not even really an issue. It's something more that we're looking at and trying to understand. But as you progress in devotional service, you will feel the pain of others, and the more intensely you feel it, the more you want to eliminate it. 
It's like, well, let, let's say, P, let's say if you were in pain, physical pain, and you're thinking to yourself, okay, I deserve it. I deserve worse. I can learn from this. But you're in so much pain, you, you feel like dying. And so you're, you know, if I can get rid of your pain, you're not going to say, well, uh, let me suffer. It'll be good. Uh, you just need to get rid of the pain. So that's the, the pure devotee feels the pain of the conditioned soul sometimes more than they feel, or usually more than they feel. So because he's feeling that pain, he just wants to eliminate it. But um, this is beyond our realization in terms of, you know, we would never feel that level of compassion, at least not yet. But we can feel enough compassion that we'll do, we'll make personal sacrifices to help people. For sure we can do that. Hmm. I hope that's okay. So, you know, I think you can put it all together and make sense out of it. You know, if you have a son or child, I think it makes sense. If they're in pain, you might think, well, you know, I told them not to do that and they did it. So this is really a good learning lesson. And they're screaming. You just get in the car, we're going to the hospital. Or you're looking for some aspirin or, isn't it? So, and, Everything you're saying, well, this is good. It's a learning lesson. I told them not to do it. They never listened to me. Now they're probably going to listen. And all. But it's not, you're not just going to let them sit there and scream. It hurts you too much. Something like that. Hajinkya says, gratitude beyond words to you on today's Guru Purnima. I will follow your teachings and the teachings of Prabhupada and the Guru Shisha Parampara. To the best of my ability, always in my life. Thank you. That's um, if you can follow the teachings of your gurus, you will become empowered by their shakti and nothing better. You will be successful. And when we lose faith in our guru, if we tap into our guru with love and devotion, we become empowered. We can do amazing things. We're not amazing, but we can do amazing things. Right? You agree? I hope you agree. It's true. I was just watching this this book distributor, his name, I think his name is Mahat. 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 Big festival, Mahotsava. I think that's his name. And the world's record for big books was, was made, I don't know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. It was 900 in one day. And he wanted to break that. And the reason he wanted to break it is his guru, Maharaj, wrote him a letter and said, why don't you distribute 100 big books sometimes? So they got in his head and he said he went and just became fixated on doing that. And he did it. He actually did 1,120 books, I think. Big books. He did 1,500 books that day. Or 1,100, 1,140 big books. I don't know how anybody could do that. It's beyond me. But he said it was, it was the mercy of his guru, that instruction, and just that did it. And his faith in the words of his guru. So that that was such a good good example to show how that faith empowers us. Yes, Sir Shore said the same thing. Yeah, follow me. That means I have to be going back to Godhead. So I'll make sure that I I walk in the right way. So when you follow me, we won't fall. Into, that's the you know, I was telling some devotees in Mexico, when, when the spiritual master initiates a disciple, the disciple says, I will follow you. At the same time, the guru is committing to follow his guru, because if you're going to follow me, I have to follow him. Otherwise, I can't help you. So I have to try to perfectly follow my guru. So while you're making your commitments, to chant your 16 rounds and four principles and follow 
we as gurus are making our commitments to do that better and better and better because that's our obligation to you. So we're actually making, you don't know this, but we're actually making vows to you as well. It's like in any relationship, right? It's not just one side. We're making vows. I mean, sometimes if a devotee doesn't follow well, some gurus may give up on them. Say, you know, you're not my disciple anymore. You don't follow. Most gurus will not say that. They're, they're committed to you, to bringing you back to Godhead. Of course, if you give them up, then they can't do that. But it's good for you to know that your guru, gurus, are also making vows to you. Krishna Premi said, I had this after going to a psychologist. The more I healed, the more I started noticing unhealthy things the people surrounding me are doing. But that really worried me as I thought I started lacking humility for seeing things which are wrong, so to say. It's a real problem. And of course, committed offenses in my mind thinking I know better. Remembering that we are just in a hospital, trying to make something better out of ourselves helps to get back to reality. Well. Uh, um, Krishna Premi, there's and all of us. Try to remember that the way the world works is that if we're fixated on someone else's fault, there's every chance in the world that fault will infest us. It'll boomerang. So just be very careful. We think, well, I don't have that fault, I'm better. Often that's the way in which that fault affects us. It just comes back. So be careful. At least never think that you are immune to that fault, although you may feel that way. Yeah, I could never act like that, but that's not true. Maya is more powerful than you might think. She could. It's nice to have the determination internally, I will never do that. That's good. We should have that. But there's always in the back of our mind the understanding that Maya is very powerful, and I could. I could do what this other devotee is doing. I should never think that I'm immune. I don't plan to, I'm determined not to, but I should be aware that that determination has to be very strong. Dinanath says, admitting mistakes also depends how humble the person is. Yes. Not also, essentially, yes. Samira says, I feel like correcting someone who is senior is not appropriate, like in itself, it's offensive. Generally, it is. Who am I, who's only a few years in this movement, start to correct someone who's over 30 years in the movement? How to deal with that? Well, it's easy, because in, in most cultures, you'll get your head chopped off for doing that, and I think you're in that culture. So if you value, value your head, you don't want to do it. But there's a problem. The problem is, what if we need to point it out because what the person's doing is becoming problematic either for you or for others in a way which is detrimental to your or their devotional service or detrimental to the temple or the spreading of Krishna consciousness, the culture of the temple, the sanctity and so forth. You may not be the one to say it, but you may have to say it to someone who can say it. So that's kind of a, you know, it's kind of an obligation we have if we, you know, if you see something is wrong and you don't say anything. Just imagine right now, like in, in all of our temples, probably there's something wrong, but it may not be a big thing. But if you see a problem that's going to fester and it's going to cause problems for devotees and it's going to cause problems for devotees in the future, now imagine you're on your deathbed and you didn't tell anybody. How would you feel? Dying, knowing that this is an unsolved problem and that many people will suffer from this. You're going to think, I should have said something. And sometimes um, it's just a matter of being with the right people, doing it in the right way in order to uh, guarantee as far as possible that our words will be accepted as not offensive. And of course, 
Samira, the main thing is to not have an offensive mentality, but a, a very humble mentality. So it's not a common thing. You know, when I talk about these things, I don't mean this is a common everyday affair. I'm going to all the senior people and telling them what's wrong with them. It's not like that. I'm just saying that it does happen. And in some situations, if we don't speak up, it could be disastrous. It's possible. So if you're ever in a situation where you foresee disaster, um, you're now guilty because you didn't say anything. So you just have to be able to say it to somebody who could then say it to somebody who could then say it to somebody. It may have to happen that way. And um, if it's not a major problem, if it's just an individual's problem, it's not affecting others and there's no way to communicate that, then there's no need to bother yourself with it other than just what we've discussed that this could also happen to me and I have to be vigilant. Normal, you know, but I can say from experience and the experience of other gurus, if a disciple has an issue or concern that they can't express, they'll often go away in frustration. So better they express it in, in a good way. I don't think, you know, you asked me to do this, Gurmarsh, but I don't think this is a good idea for this or that, or I, I, I have doubt that that's actually what Prabhupada wants me to do. So we can discuss it. And if we're talking about a culture that, uh, that's vulnerable, then the guru could say, you're right. Uh, that was not the best instruction, I agree. And it's resolved. And he doesn't lose faith, actually. His faith creases because his guru could listen and admit a mistake. And he understands that, well, in material affairs, my guru may not be perfect. He told me to sell, sell my house, but I realized. I talked to a real estate agent and said, the market's going to be going up in the next three years. Better I wait three years. And my guru is not following the market in, in uh, where are you, in Pune. So, you know, so he says, okay. So Gurmash says, okay. Or Gurmash may say, no, but I, living, living in that house is bad for your spiritual life. Forget the money. It's not as important as your spiritual life. And they go, oh, I didn't see it that way. Yeah. So then you may be surprised also, but you have a discussion. So you may have to be the humble one or he may have to be the humble one. But in a culture like that, we can respectfully speak. But as you know, Generally, the superiors are always supposed to be right and the juniors are always supposed to be wrong, which of course is not true. That's where the problem comes, making, living with that assumption. But it's, a, it's also part of our culture. So sometimes, even if the, the superior is wrong, you just, and they won't admit it, you just have to accept it and say, okay, I'm sorry I brought it up. That's also part of culture. And someone else will have to deal with it, or maybe there's nothing you can do. But I personally think if something is seriously wrong and we don't say anything, Prabhupada would say, why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you do something? You knew devotees were suffering. You knew this was wrong. Why didn't you do something? And so all of you in your own sphere, they're going to have to think about this. But there's as we've discussed, there's always a very good way to do this and a very bad way to do it. And I think the bad way is more common than the good way. And even if you do it in a good way, if it produces a bad reaction, that means you did it in a bad way. So you can't, you can't always claim innocence because you do something the right way. It's just you didn't calculate that that person would not be able to hear it. And so you did it in the wrong way. You know, if I, if I give you a good instruction, but you aren't able to digest it or follow it, then I need to give you an instruction that will, you'll be able to digest and follow. Otherwise, my good instruction doesn't do any good for you. And then I'm actually to blame, even though I gave you a good instruction, because I didn't, I couldn't evaluate 
that that instruction was not something you could follow. So it's my fault. But many of us don't think that way. We only look at the instruction. Well, the instruction is good. So if the instruction is good and I gave it and you don't follow it, it's your fault, which may be true in many cases, but not always. Maybe my fault for giving that instruction because I, I should have known you couldn't follow it in the first place. So. So many things to take in consideration, culture, etiquette. But um, if we can keep the culture and the etiquette and at the same time resolve an issue, if the issue is serious and is resolvable, that's the best. Because I, I think a lot of you in your old, in old years will regret that you, if something is a problem and it festers into the future, and it becomes a much bigger problem, you'll regret you didn't do something. Why didn't I do something? Because sometimes the problem can become so big, it'll be too late to do anything. Whereas you say, well, in 2022, I could have done something. Now it's 2042, it's too late. It's already within the culture. It's, it would take 100 years to change. So something to think about. It's like we have a lot going on here. You mentioned that we would be worried if someone seems perfect rather than if they are vulnerable and admit their mistakes. Many leaders want to appear emotionally strong or don't want to burden the dependents. So they do not share their struggles. For me, I feel like sharing my struggles helps others relate to me and be vulnerable. How should there be some boundaries? Where you don't share struggles, how much should you share? Where do you draw the line? Um, depends on you and depends on the person. So it's true. In one sense, you don't want to, as a leader, you don't want to look like you're an emotional wreck because because no one, everyone will think, oh, you know, it's like the the alcoholic mother that the eight year old kids have to take care of, you know. So you don't want to create that environment. Your vulnerability um, should be a manifestation of your humility, your humility. But in terms of like opening up for healing, that should be done with equals or, or superiors, generally not with juniors. It's, it's kind of inappropriate for them, it, but it may not, it may be just a burden for them and it may disturb their respect for you. But to open up on some other issues where it's just an admittance that yes, I also struggle with this, um, that will help them. But if it's like a whole life story and an emotional dump, that should not be done on juniors generally. It wouldn't help. But but to you know acknowledge if they're struggling with something to acknowledge, say I struggle with that also. It's really difficult. That's very helpful for them to know that. They're not the only one. But if it's like, hey, I struggle with that and I have, you know, I'm suffering, you know, panic attacks and I got, you know, severe trauma. I've been in therapy for 20 years. You know, it's like, they don't need that. It's not going to help them. That's for, that's for somebody else, superior or a friend or a therapist. Sometimes some things are just for a therapist, not for anybody else. Because um, I hope that's clear. I think it's kind of logical, isn't it? Question from Longa. What's the difference between being compassionate and being sentimental? There may or may not be a difference. It depends on how you're feeling. I mean, you know, the word sentimental as it's used in ISKCON is not really how it's used in the dictionary. As far as I remember, I did a little study on this a couple of years ago, and we use this, the word sentimental as a very negative word. He's very sen sentimental just means feeling, doesn't it? Someone want to look up the dictionary definition of sentimental? You know, 
when we say sentimental, we mean a person who's emotional and doesn't use their intelligence, isn't it? Is that what we mean in this kind? They're, um, you know, they don't have a philosophical understanding. It's all just feeling. I don't, I mean, if that's how we define it, that's fine, if that's what you mean. Um, and if you're defining it that way, then we can say compassion should be based on philosophy. Um, sentimental compassion would be um, like Arjuna, misplaced compassion. It's not, it's not really doing anything for anybody, right? You go off book distribution on Sankirtan because um, there's a problem and you go to thrift shop and you're buying clothes for everybody and you don't distribute any books. All right, you're compassionate, you're a devotee, you don't want to see people suffer, but that might be um, not exactly the best way to show compassion. Better to give knowledge and leave the clothing for the Salvation Army or others. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what comes to mind. It's, it's a compassion, a sentimental compassion would, would also be more focused on the body than anything else than spiritual advancement. Sentimental compassion could also be compassion beyond what you actually have, but you think you have it, and then you, you try to exhibit high levels of compassion and make personal sacrifice, and then you suffer burnout because it's not really your level. You're not that compassionate yet. You write a prayer to Lord Chaitanya, please put all the karma of the world on my shoulders. That would be a bit sentimental, don't you think? I mean, are you prepared for that? That is, uh, only a few great souls are prepared for that. For sure. Question from Vrindavan Ishri Basi. If I try to be better than I am, trying to overcome my anarthas and practicing what is good, even if I'm not spontaneous, am I pretending to be somebody I'm not? Am I a cheater? Um, that will depend on how you think. But the way you described it, no. It, it's, it's okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try to be better, so I'm gonna finish all my rounds in the morning, I'm gonna get up early, I'm gonna do A, B, and C. So once I start doing that, if I think, oh, now I'm better than everybody, or and now I'm free from an artist, then that would be pretending. But if I understand I'm doing this because I'm weak, I need to do this to become strong. I need to really push myself. That's not pretending, that's being real. So pretending means not knowing where you stand. You know, like I told the story of one sannyasi, he said, I didn't get married because I knew I wouldn't be able to control myself in the presence of a woman. So I thought I'll take sannyas, right? So something like that. He's honest about it. Not that I'm a big sannyasi, big renunciate. No, I couldn't do it any other way. So that's not, it's not artificial. He's not pretending. He's not pretending to be something he's not. He's admitting, no, this is why I did it. Because I'm not qualified, I did it to become qualified. Does that make sense, friend of an issue? If it doesn't, just keep asking. No one is immune to Maya, except the pure devotee. Comment from Pete. Thank you so much for another wise, inspirational answer for answering questions. I guess my question came from a place where Codependency has often been a problem. I often find it difficult to say no to other people. I sometimes lose myself. In the run of trying to be there for others, I want to care and cry for people. And it comes from my heart. But sometimes I need to remind myself to also make sure that my needs are met, that I don't do that much. Yeah, of course. I often find it difficult to keep the balance. Just be real and you'll understand your limitations. 
I said, working with people is an interesting challenge when you have that kind of nature. I'm working on finding the balance between self-care and caring for others. There is no balance. Care for yourself first. That comes for, there's no compromise in self-care. No balance, there's no balancing. The balance comes after you care for yourself, then the balance will come, not before. Um, you can't care for others if you don't care for yourself. Um, yeah, I, and I understood that about your question, but um, what we were talking about was so high and so in another universe from our own issues that um, it's good to, to understand the context of that, that it has nothing to do with my own, my own challenges. This is completely transcendental. So that when I have to take it down to my level, it's obvious that my level is my level and their level is their level. And I have to adapt accordingly. Kavita, what's for dinner? <laughs> my lunch, it's uh, lunch. Uh, it's lunch? Oh yeah, you're in New Jersey, I thought, yeah. I, I, I'm in Delaware. Oh, you're in Delaware. Yeah, it's close enough. Yeah. Yeah, I'm making uh, uh, fried rice, pakora, potato pakora, and uh, bundi raita and guacamole. Well, you're bona fide Indian because you're making potatoes. Uh, yeah, today, like after a long time. Potatoes. The, the British got you guys hooked up on potatoes. Did you know that? There were no potatoes in India until the British came. Did you know that? There were no chilies in India until the Portuguese came. You know, like these foods which are considered Indian, well, they didn't exist until foreigners brought them. It's so funny, isn't it? I want to be Indian, so I'm gonna eat chilies. Uh, chilies are not Indians, Portuguese. Potatoes, oh, it's British. Tomatoes, I don't know where tomatoes came, yeah. It's funny, you know. Once you study history, you see how stupid people are. No offense to anybody, but. You know, it's just history is funny. And when you study it, you know, you realize that things are not the way you think they are at all. Um, anyway, we can we can deal with your question, P, a little more in that. Um, I mean, it actually is a good question because what's happening with P's question is that we're looking at something which could only be conceived of and executed by someone who is totally transcendental. And we're looking at it and we're thinking, ah, if I tried to do that, I'd probably end up in a mental ins insane asylum. You know, I would be burned out and, uh, and I'd end up hating myself because I couldn't do it. And you know, just, just go down this whole rabbit hole, right? Of, of issues that I would face. So from the onset, we should understand that's them and this is us. So then we have to gauge how much of what we can do before we burn out because we don't want to burn out and what we're capable and incapable of doing. And we're doing a course on self-love, self-acceptance. And um, one of the things that comes out from that course is that you you really can't take care of other people if you don't take care of yourself. You really can't show compassion to others. If you don't show it to yourself, you can't really ultimately love others if you don't love yourself. And some of these ideas, they don't, they don't appear so apparent in our philosophy. Although all of you, all of you out there who have studied this or who are psychologists, you understand it. The confusion comes is when you read our books and you don't see all these terms. And you go, oh, it must be different. Then you see something like this where someone is doing total self-sacrifice and you kind of like think, okay, I need a new paradigm. But we don't need a new paradigm. We need, we just need, um, we have a theoretical model. We understand it academically. This is what happens when you have love. But now back on the ranch, so to speak, we have us, embodied conditioned souls who are trying to be compassionate within the limitations of our conditioning. So 
we can't really be good for anybody if we burn ourselves out, obviously. And you know that, Pete, so I'm just confirming what you already know. I'm assuming you know this. You probably teach it to your clients, right? But um, Prabhupada never, never talked about self-love and compassion as a balance as much as it's a byproduct of self-love. So if you just get the self-love, it'll balance out automatically. If you don't have it, it'll never be balanced. I hope that makes sense. Because it's, you know, so many things in Krishna consciousness are byproducts of doing something right. They're not balances per se. So we, we as young devotees, we become devotees and we're like, yes, let's go for it. And then we go for it. And then, you know, 10 years later, we're like, whoa, what was I doing? What was I thinking? You know, because we realized that was just, a, you know, a young enthusiastic devotee pushing for pure devotional service, which he thought, you know, trying to get catch the moon. And then we realize, oh, I have this whole other side of me that I just neglected for the last 10 years, and now it's taken over. And I realize I can't do that. That's not sustainable. That was good for a few years. It was fun. You know, being a pure devotee, you know, when you're 22, jump in a van and drive around and sell books, you know, it's ecstatic. But then life hits, you know, when you're 30. Midlife crisis hits earlier, hits earlier these. I guess it's the first midlife crisis. And you realize, oh, that was just, that was not who was sustainable for me. And so then you start getting into what's real, what's sustainable. Because if you don't, you fall on your face. And I can only say this from having seen it in the lives of many. Does that make sense to all of you? You know, it's like, you know, you know, you're running the mile race. You go, I'm going to win this race. And you just, you're ahead of the crowd. And about halfway through the race, everybody passes you up because you didn't realize you can't run that fast the whole time. Do you ever see that happen in track and field? Somebody shoots out, but they can't maintain it. And the people who are kind of conserving their energy for the long run, they just pass that person up. And he's trying to catch up and he can't. He has no energy, not enough. Right? Is that okay? So that's part of, it's just part of understanding what's real for you. You know, I would say, I'm always like, be real, but shoot above real. Just shoot a little bit above. So you're always, you're not just becoming apathetic or lazy, you know, because if you don't have a goal of high Krishna consciousness, it's just depressing. You know, if you don't think, yeah, I'd like to be like this pure devotee. It just becomes depressing, doesn't it? You know, it's like, oh, I'm just being real and depressed. What's the point of that? Be real and excited about the next level. Just be grounded on the level you're at. Otherwise, how you get to the next level. Okay, it is now time to chant Japa. Tanya, can you say these questions? We will. Um, their questions or comments. Sometimes they're hard to. Maybe when we have the Russian class, we can just. Well, it won't be relevant to the Russians because they're not in this class. Anyway, you will, well, we'll have to remember what we were.